If you're starting a patient on SGLT2 inhibitors, um, how would you cancel that patient as regards side effects? Yes, yeah, so I think you just need to warn the patient of the possibility that they might have some slight postural hypotension initially. Typically, people adapt to it. It's a matter of just keeping them hydrated. It, more caution clearly should be used in patients on diuretics, but the reports at this point point do not show anything of significance. So it's really just potentially cautioning patients, making sure they keep up with fluids, and that should be adequate. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is directed towards Dr. Leroy. Um, so from the discussion, we have been informed that diabetes increases cancer risk. Um, has this been compared in other ethnicities and other countries? Um, so are there, basically, are there any specific ethnicities the question pertains particularly to the Japanese population and the Asian population. So do you know any differences in the risk? So there have been a lot of studies uh, coming out of Korea, Asia, etc. Most of the studies are looking at cancer in general. Uh, although it is true in Japan there's much more hepatocellular carcinoma. That's well known in Japanese. And there you'll see this increased risk. So it depends on the cancer that's in that particular group. But most of the studies have been confirmed in other uh, the European studies uh, are, you know, there are many studies from Europe that are similar, and uh, as I say, Japanese, Korea, um, China especially, confirming it. And yes, there are certain differences ethnic-wise, the Japanese, as I said, hepatic. Okay, so the next question, um, I guess is towards Dr. Levy again, or Dr. Tamler. Um, is there a triglyceride level above which you would not prescribe GLP-1 analogs or DPP-4 inhibitors? Triglyceride mm. level. So to the best of my recollection, um, there isn't really a triglyceride contraindication. Now that said, this becomes the pancreatitis risk, which is, the, I think, the question you're getting at here. And the answer to that is, is that I think you need to treat all therapies. If a patient has a triglyceride over 1,000, you should treat the triglycerides first and not expect, although improving glycemic control will drop triglycerides, that using a GLP-1 or a DPP-4 product will reduce that enough that you're safe. I think you need to treat the additional risks and then consider, uh, consider agents. But there's been no reports of higher triglyceride levels in combinations with GLP-1 analogs or DPP-4s that it proposed um, lead to an increased risk. I, I wanted to add? say something yeah. from your lecture. Yeah. You mentioned that the suggestion is if they've had pancreatitis, you yeah. should be careful. I think anybody who's had pancreatitis should not get a GLP-1 receptor agonist. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to put in my two cents, which is yeah. if somebody has hypertriglyceridemia, First of all, that is something that we frequently see in uncontrolled diabetes. Exactly. Um, but also there's a fantastic agent available to treat hypertriglyceridemia, and that's insulin. Um, so it may be that this situation requires insulin. It depends on the individual patient. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is directed towards Dr. Tamler, but I, I'm guessing Dr. Leroy may also have an opinion. So increasing numbers of patients have diabetes and cancer. Please talk about treatment of hyperglycemia as part of cancer care. For example, recommended medications. Wow. Well, this is a very um, important question because more of our patients are living with cancer as a chronic disease. And also, Mount Sinai has become this really big cancer center, and we're seeing many more patients with cancer who have diabetes, uh, where diabetes is relevant in the sense that A, it arises sometimes in the context of the cancer treatment, because often steroids are used or other agents that can increase blood sugar, and B, it's now, the diabetes is now relevant because these patients are expected to live, live longer, live through the cancer, and so um, this is, as the phone is indicating, a wake-up call for us. Um, so, um, and, and this is a completely new challenge. We are not really used to that, treating c chronic conditions in, in patients that are supposed to have you know, cancer. So um, th the way that I view it is that I take every patient individually and look at their needs and look at their horizon and their social background and what they can tolerate. And so it's a very individual decision. And some patients um, just have very mild hyperglycemia and do just fine with metformin, for instance. 
Other patients have serious comorbidity that prohibit a lot of agents, and so they have to be on insulin. Other, and, and usually it's postprandial hyperglycemia because many of the agents that treat cancer will, will lead to hyperglycemia. And sometimes it's situational where patients will have hyperglycemia for a few days after a chemo course. So that's the, the, uh, the background to that. Is there a generic, general, blanket statement that I would make, this agent is great for patients with cancer? No, I would not be able to make that. So I just wanted to say that at Sinai, we also have an ongoing study looking at the effect of cancer patients on their diabetes therapy. Uh, so it works both ways, as you were saying. It's the diabetes affecting the cancer, and the cancer also affecting diabetes therapy. I have no idea. Does anybody know what IPMN stands for? One of the oh, questions. There's, there's somebody yeah. waving, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry? Sorry. Intraductal papillary mucinous Intraductal papillary mucinous Pancreatic. Neoplasm. Oh, okay. Oh, you can see how so such yeah, oncologists we are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how we're going to answer this question. Yeah. This is directed to Dr. Levy or Dr. DeRoy. No, no, Dr. Levy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and then if I may just add back to the question that was just raised, um, because I'm not going to not give an answer. I will say that a lot of the oncologists are routinely putting patients without contraindications now on metformin, and you may have seen this as well. I've taken care of several patients where, unless there's a reason not to, okay, well, you've got cancer. There are even checking for tumor responsiveness, yeah. and I know you, um, you're well aware of that, that literature, so I'm trying to avoid the question that was just asked, but <laughs> I'll, I, you know, I'll answer it. Is, you know, it. There's no proven data at this point. If you're concerned that there might be an effect, you might want to discontinue it. There isn't, in a court of law, there'll always be some lawyer that will raise some issue to you, but nothing is proven at this point, but there are always, as Dr. Tamler said, alternative th treatments that you need to individualize. That's not a question I can provide you with a clear answer on. I think that was just to clarify, that was the question in regards to Genuvia, whether you would stop it in a patient with pancreatic cancer. Exactly. Cancer. Yes. Okay. Um, so the next question is also on the cancer theme. So um, if insulin resistance may lead to an increased risk of breast cancer, has it been shown that there is an increased risk of breast cancer in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome? So that's a great question. And the answer is we don't really know because one of the problems, remember, is that in epidemiology you need the nurse's health study the European study, you need hundreds and thousands of individuals to look at the connection. When you only have hundreds of patients, it's very hard to do any statistical analysis. There have been suggestions, and that's the same problem we have with type 1s. We're not quite sure what the cancer risk is. There are some studies where type 1 patients have an increased risk of gastric and other cancers, not the typical ones that I showed you, but the data's soft. In other words, there's just not enough patients long enough to really put the two together, and the same with PCOS. But um, I, would, I would look at PCOS as the insulin resistant, like the obese or the diabetic, and monitor them very carefully with the same idea. So I think it's a great question. Okay, thank you. So there are two questions um, directed towards Dr. Levy regarding um, how, what's the best treatment for patients with chronic kidney disease? Um, and an A1C between 7 and 8%, and does treating them to less than 7% result in more hospitalizations? Okay. I'm going to also let you take, take a role in this one. <laughs> um, so the best agent for patients with chronic kidney disease, so you need to think about what your contraindications are and which products are usable, and you also need to think, I think you said the A1C was 7 to 8? Yeah. Seven to 8. So you have to look at a lot of factors in a patient. I'm not going to give use this. Um, the factors you need to think about is what is their underlying cardiovascular status. Perhaps using a low dose of citagliptin would be adequate or another DPP-4 inhibitor if they have cardiovascular disease and your A1C goal may not be quite as low as it might be in another patient. You may want to think about insulin. Insulin's always safe and tried and true. You can't go wrong with it. The GLP-1 products, interestingly, exanatide has some contraindications in renal insufficiency, but liraglutide, although there are small studies on it, is, um, that, you know, is broken down by, um, by gut hormones, you know, di um, 
endopeptidases, so that would be a consideration. But you really need to look at your products and determine what can I use safely and what will provide efficacy. You're not going to get much bang for your buck with an SGLT2 inhibitor with significantly impaired renal function. The only thing about the yeah. GLP-1, yeah. say, the liraglutide, is you want to be careful if they develop nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, yeah. the dehydration, they'll worsen any pre-renal effect. Yes. So, yes, you can use it, but you just want to be careful. You have careful. to use everything with caution in the, this, that type of population. Insulin's always the tried and true one, for better or for worse. Okay, thank you. Um, there was one more, right? I'm tr or did um, I answer? You did well. You did well. I did well enough? Okay. <laughs> Good job. So the next question is directed to Dr. Tamler. Um, so this is a specific uh, case of a patient with type 2 diabetes, and the problem is that they have uh, set their postprandial um, dinner blood sugar is always elevated, and the patient works at night, so they have their dinner about 1 to 3 a.m., sleeps at work but has poor sleep habits and is currently taking metformin and Victoza. So basically the blood glucose is higher than the target range. So the two questions are, um, are we seeing a dawn effect and a question about if bromocryptine would help? That's a really good question. Um, so um, uh, first of all, um, troubled day-night rhythm, be it because patients have sleep apnea or be it because um, they're up at night um, because of small children, or be it because, <laughs> or be it because they are shift workers, um, has been shown to be associated with raised blood glucose levels. And in the, in the case of shift workers, there has been a strong connection between shift work and the development of, of um, uh, type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome also. So yes, that is a, that is a big deal. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that show that um, bromocryptine um, is more effective or less effective in shift workers. I think that that would be something that one would have to try out on an individual basis. Um, one thing, though, is that if this person eats at work um, and that's kind of the main meal, um, and has no contraindication, one could consider maybe a carbose right before that main, main meal. Um, it depends on whether that person works alone, maybe. Um, but, but it is an option. Um, and, and again, um, there, there are other options. And it, it, from what I gather, this person is probably overweight, obese, uh, because they are on metformin and liraglutide. Um, uh, so another option, um, uh, could be an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor uh, if you want to lower overall um, uh, blood glucose. But if you're specifically worried about blood sugar at night, then it's postprandial blood sugar. Uh, then those are your option, options. Another option is for the patient to keep uh, an insulin pen with rapid acting insulin uh, at work and just give themselves, because this is the one big meal of the day, a shot of insulin with that meal to cover it. Um, so all of these are, are options, and I'm sure that I'm missing out on some. They're, they're already on insulin point to two ratio. Oh, they, they already are. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I must have missed that. Lunch is all right. It's just that night shift, no matter what we add, no matter how much insulin, it's always that no matter, you know, we started with insulin, add this, add this. Yeah. So to repeat uh, the, 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 the question um, for the benefit of everybody in the audience, uh, this patient is on metformin, liraglutide, and um, uh, basal bolus insulin? Yeah. Basal bolus insulin, um, and it's always the postprandial sugar at night, overnight, uh, that gives so much trouble. Um, and what I have found is, and, and no matter how much you raise that insulin dose, it just gets more and more and more. And what I have frequently found in these patients is that they often take virtual insulin, which is that they say, yes, doctor, and you increase the dose more and more and more and more, and they say, yes, 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 yes. And then when you ask them, so of your 21 injections with prandial insulin per week, how many do you give yourself? They'll tell you 14 because they may be embarrassed to be injecting insulin at work um, uh, or, or because they just forget. Um, and so that is something that 
could be explored with the patient. I'm not saying this is a cop-out, I'm saying this because that is something that we see and often with these patients when they do come into a controlled setting, either because a relative gives them their insulin or because you read them the riot act and they take the prescribed dose, they go hypoglycemic because you've been raising the insulin dose more and more and more but for that meal and they haven't been taking it. So uh, we can talk more about that patient maybe also after the panel. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is again directed towards Dr. Chandler, Dr. Oh. Levy. Oh, okay. <laughs> start but maybe um, Dr. Levy. So um, it's two questions based around the same topic. Um, so the first is um, discuss the use of metformin um, for insulin resistance, for example, in a patient with an A1C of 5.6%. And along the same lines is, do you have any other recommendations apart from metformin diet and exercise for such patients? Okay, so and it looks like Derek wants to say something on this one too, but I'll start. So the real question that's coming up here is, if, if the question was the A1C of 5.7, you're really asking about the diabetes prevention trial showing that metformin does show benefit in preventing progression to type 2 diabetes. At 5.6, this is an off-label use of metformin, but sometimes people will use it with the, concept, with the conceptual idea that lowering insulin levels will help with weight loss. So once again, off-label use could be considered, could be individualized for a patient. However, that said, the most important thing is diet and exercise. People use off-label products all the time for other agents. You know, that's not the purpose of this discussion, but there are many weight losing products. I think the most important thing is to really individualize, counsel your patient, and particularly if that patient has a strong family history of type 2 diabetes, to really reinforce the risk and to monitor that patient closely. So I have a different question. Is the patient obese? Was that the idea? It doesn't say that, but they can be. Let's assume the patient's yeah. obese. Presuming it's obese. Wouldn't you, get, wouldn't you get better weight reduction from the new product, two new They're products They're off-label, the and that's why I didn't mention them. Two new products for uh, for Oh, for weight support. loss. Yeah. yeah, we could use those, of course. Yeah, good point. Bel Belvic and... Kisma, yeah, the, we're talking uh, generic now. Quismia, yeah, yes. Yeah. Xemia. That's, that's so, so, um, yeah. yeah, so locazarin and... And the combo. The combo. And uh, fentermin slash topiramate, right. yes. Um, that that, that would be for obesity. Yes. That would be for obesity, right. yeah. Yeah, but if the patient it, loses right. weight, they're also going to yeah. delay their, if they're pre-diabetic. Okay, so the next question is again directed towards Dr. Chandler. So for what types of patients do you use sulfonylurea as a second line rather than DPP-4 inhibitors? Ah. That's a Good very question. loaded question, um, and it depends. Uh, the, the answer, um, uh, uh, so different endocrinologists will give you very different answers towards that. Um, I do prescribe a fair share of sulfonylureas. Um, I prescribe them because they are inexpensive and they do the job. You know, um, a sulfonyluria will cost uh, $10 for a three month supply, um, and there are once a day options like glimepiride. Um, and they, they, they frequently do the job. They do have a risk of hypoglycemia, uh, which DPP-4 inhibitors do not have. However, I also find that, especially early on in, in diabetes, these agents have much greater A1C lowering effect uh, than DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, and um, so I do prescribe a fair share. Um, I prescribe it in patients that uh, I prescribe sulfonylureas in patients who are very price sensitive, and I prescribe sulfonylureas as second agents uh, in patients that need a strong A1C uh, reduction and uh, do not have strong risks associated with hypoglycemia. Um, you can even see in the community that some pharma pharmacists tell patients, oh, you want to save money? go with the sulfonylurea instead of a DPP-4, that is inappropriate because the two are very different agents and if I prescribe a DPP-4 um, uh, inhibitor, it's for a reason. And so I, I find uh, that goes a little bit above what, what is called for. But there's a role for, for both agents, both, both classes. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is not directed to anybody in particular, so whoever would like this question can Dr. take it. Tamlin can Dr. Chandler oh. might like this <laughs> So why can you not use Genuvia 100 milligrams in renal insufficiency? Oh, it's, uh, it's renally excreted, and so uh, you, you just get higher levels uh, than you 
would, would, would want. And at some point, with every medication, um, the um, uh, therapeutic window is just such that you, you don't get that much more bang for your buck for the higher level, and you get more of the side effects. Mm -hmm. So you're better off dosing appropriately so that you have an overall level that gives you the best ratio between side effect profile and um, effect. Right. Okay, very good. Um, and the penultimate question um, is to Dr. Tamler or Dr. Levy, which is um, how would you approach treatment in a very elderly patient over 80 or 85 who develops an A1C of over 7.5%? Would a carbos or uh, be a good choice? And when would you stop using metformin as first line therapy? Yeah, I, was, I was waiting for the metformin question. Um, so, you know, there's package guidelines in terms of metformin, and the recommendation is over the age of 80, you should use it with caution, monitor kidney function, potentially dose reduce it, or to actually get a 24 hour urine creatinine clearance. That's the recommendation. In, in the real world, the risk of lactic acidosis appears to be a lot lower. And once again, this is not on the package insert. This is not a label. I think most of us will consider safety but reduce the dose of metformin. And you once again, you're going to hate this answer. You've got to individualize it to the patient. But you can consider that, but that wouldn't necessarily be my first line for new treatment therapy. I think the DPP-4 inhibitors are a good choice. Dr. Tamler is a slightly bigger fan of acrobos than I am. Um, and interestingly, just off the record, studies in Dr. Tamler is German, studies have shown that the Europeans actually tolerate acrobos and use it much more than we do here in the U.S. I think acrobos is a reasonable choice if a patient doesn't have GI issues. Because they're used to eating sauerkraut. I guess That's so. Right. Yeah. And, and they all work in their own uh, offices and don't have open <laughs> no, offices. Yeah. Um, but but um, uh, so seriously, I think yeah. it's a matter of culture. Yeah. Um, geriatricians prescribe metformin all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just very worried um, uh, because of a few cases of uh, lactic acidosis. So we want to go with the recommendations, but sometimes it's, uh, it may be appropriate to push the envelope with close monitoring. Um, that said, you know, that is already an off-label use. Yeah. Now, I know that Europeans are trying to push the limits for metformin use um, to more audacious uh, GF GFR levels uh, than uh, what is um, recommended in the U.S. guidelines. And uh, what we really need is, is uh, more clinical data uh, to show. The problem is that it's a generic medication, and so there's no money in it for anybody to show that metformin uh, actually can be used relatively safely um, at uh, lower GFR levels than currently. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the final question then is regarding prandin and Starlix. Can these be used in patients who are fearful of bolus insulin in treatment of high postprandial blood sugars? It's not directed to anybody in particular, so. Dr. Levy looks like she okay. wants to answer more. The answer is maybe. Depends how high their glucose levels are. Depends, it, you know, we will sometimes use, use a product like that in a patient who declines therapy with meal insulin. So you already have them on basal. They say, I absolutely will not take bolus. It's better than nothing. It may not get you to your glucose control goals, but it, it will give you some prandial kick. Now that said, if a patient makes no, has no beta cell reserve, you're not gonna get particularly far with that. But it's something you can use, but it's not an adequate alternative for someone who's having significant high postprandial levels. And the other piece of that is, is you have to be cautious about boosting up the basal and continually boosting up the basal because then someone skips a meal, they're going to get hypoglycemic. So you don't want to just use basal to manage it meal, uh, meal, meal coverage as well. Okay, thank you. That's so it. thank you all for the questions. This, uh, thank you. Thank you.